I wasn't expecting much from the Tyson Fury Dillian White uh, contest in terms of competitiveness, and uh, we got exactly that. Uh, I thought White was a really good prospect in 2015, back in 2015, uh, right before he faced Anthony Joshua. You know, I thought he was a fairly good uh, technician with a good punch repertoire, but he since proved to be a bit chinny, and uh, add in the fact that he has only average foot speed, and you know, you're looking at a fighter that was pretty much made to order for Tyson Fury. Now, White could never cut off the ring and was outclassed. Um, this was the first time that I've seen a fighter uh, grasping at straws from the opening bell as White started off the fight in a southpaw stance. So it was apparent that he realized that there wasn't anything he could do to uh, fend off the inevitable. He simply doesn't have the talent or skills to be competitive with a fighter like Fury. A right uppercut put him out of his misery in the sixth round, but again, the writing was on the wall for this kind of result. We can go back to all those occasions when White was knocked down in previous bouts, and the knockout he suffered against the ancient uh, Alexander Povetkin. White has pretty much established himself as a second-tier brawler, and he never had so much as a puncher's chance in this matchup. So this was a fight with a foregone conclusion, and was meant, obviously, to be a uh, very large homecoming party for Tyson Fury. You know, he hinted that this would be his last time in the ring. Uh, I hope he doesn't retire. You know, when a fighter at the top of his game starts talking retirement, I typically hope that he does retire, because it's cool to see a champion, for once, go off into the sunset with a belt and money in the bank, and sometimes with an undefeated record. Fury only said, I think this is it. You know, he's hinting that there is room for a negotiation. There was talk of a hybrid rules fight between Fury and the UFC's uh, Francis Ngannou. Uh, they're going to box with uh, MMA-style gloves. Uh, I'd much rather see him face the winner of the Anthony Joshua-Alexander Usyk fight. I think that if Joshua wins that fight, then a matchup against Fury uh, becomes the biggest fight in UK history. And if Usyk wins, and wins impressively, uh, Fury leaves a challenge behind. I would be surprised if Fury leaves the game for good, uh, considering he still has Joshua and Usyk as fights that the fans still want to see. And he's retired before, so uh, we'll take this with about uh, 8 pounds of Morton salt. Well, this week we're going to look at some early Hector Camacho. This is about that took place in the 1980 New York Golden Gloves Tournament. Camacho has become the talk of the town in New York with his flashy fighting style. Uh, meanwhile, his opponent, Tyrone the Harlem Butcher Jackson, is no slouch himself. Uh, he's considered an up-and-comer in the New York area, and the two have met uh, two years earlier with uh, Camacho winning a decision. So this is from March of 1980, uh, the New York Golden Gloves 119-pound Open Division Championship. Manhattan High School here in New York, and his whole class is here tonight, including the English teacher, Pat, Pat Flannery, and they're here to root for him. They want him to go back with the title, his third title. Hector Camacho on the gold, and Tyrone Jackson in the blue. I see quite a lot of uh, this Camacho. He's a very well-experienced fighter. He won the 118-pound championship and the intercity title in the 119-pound class. There's quite a bit of difference in the experience, Jerry. It's third round two. That's Hector Camacho on the goal. Tyrone Jackson in the blue. Oh, yeah. 
of age. Come out, Joe, 19, Jackson. Jackson is older, but he hasn't been to the ring as often, as long or as often as Camacho, that's for sure. Camacho's is starting to find his, uh, his target oh, much easier this time. Jackson appears to be hitting with an open club, Jerry. I see. shot at this here and I want to take it. That's it. Give it my own. Who did you beat to win your goal at Love Time, Jerry? Do you remember? Well, uh, as a middleweight, I, I uh, beat Larry Dark in New York City Recreation. Uh -huh. And the heavyweights, I, uh, I beat a guy by the name of Earl's Trip. Oh, yeah. He was a good fighter on his trip. I remember very well. I was here when you won it, Jerry. I don't remember who you fought, but I remember you. Harris Trip, I remember very well. He was a good fighter. He beat a good man there. Great. With another winner in our, our contest, shake it up. Let's have a postcard, Jerry, if you can find one. <laughs> See, John just thought the whole fight this uh, come on, so he's just been beating it to the punch. Yeah. Get off first. Now Camacho would go on to the Olympic trials after this bout and lose in the semifinals to future featherweight contender Irving Mitchell before turning pro and uh, I'll assume everyone is familiar with his career after that. Uh, now what happens to Tyrone Jackson is interesting in its own way as well. You know, Jackson would turn pro a year after this bout and win 22 straight before challenging Ki Young Chung for Chung's IBF featherweight title and Jackson would be stopped in six rounds. Now what's interesting about Jackson is that he was a bit of an oddity in boxing and that he was refreshingly honest about not being the most confident guy in the ring. He said, quote, I just didn't have the killer instinct to really want to hurt people. I wanted to knock you out, don't get me wrong. I wanted to win. I definitely wanted to be world champion, but for some reason, I don't know if it was anxiety or I would just come to the fight hoping the other guy got hit by a car. I didn't care as long as I didn't have to get in that ring. Or I thought maybe this building will blow up so I don't have to fight him. I just didn't believe in myself. Now Jackson would take a year off after his loss to Chung on changing management and coming under the guidance of famed trainer Teddy Atlas. Under Atlas, Jackson would rebuild for two years, winning eight straight all by knockout before he challenged Tony Lopez for the IBF Super Featherweight title and gets stopped in eight rounds. Jackson once again froze under the lights and Atlas wanted him to retire after the fight. But Jackson refused, insisting that he still had some fight left in him. So Atlas stayed on and three fights later, uh, Jackson would lose to future featherweight champion Manuel Medina. The judges would say that he lost, but Jackson would finally fight fearlessly against one of his best opponents and score the kind of victory that doesn't show up in the record books. So this week's mailbag, I have one from Kuwaiti is not a deployment. He writes, since Spence just got past Ugas and Crawford isn't signed to top rank anymore, what's your personal opinion on A, a Crawford versus Spence fight happening next, and B, who do you think wins if that fight happens? Well, I don't 
I think the fight will happen, but I can't speculate on how the negotiations, um, how fast these negotiations will take place. You know, there's too much going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to, and I really only speculate on things that, you know, I, we can see firsthand. I don't know what fighter truly profits more at the box office because the promoters don't post what they spend to advertise the fight. We have to see what they spend to market the fight vis-a-vis -vis what the pay-per-view and the attendance numbers were. If they spend enough money, they can, you know, astroturf a fighter into popularity like we're seeing with these uh, two YouTube brothers. So, you know, I can't tell if there really should be a 50-50 split here or maybe 60-40 in favor of Spence, as I've seen posts that uh, suggest that he's the bigger box office draw. So that seems to be the main negotiating point of who gets what percentage of the revenue. Now, assuming the fight takes place, I have Crawford winning by the slimmest of margins. This is a matchup that is akin to um, an improvisational jazz musician going up against a classical pianist. Now, Crawford is boxing's best improviser. You know, he's like the jazz musician composing new tunes on the spot. He creates openings and adapts to what's in front of him. Uh, I compare him to a jazz musician, but uh, he's almost like a surgeon in breaking down his opponent's defenses, you know, finding and creating those little spots and openings over the course of the fight. Now with Spence, I don't see that much improvisation, and that isn't a criticism. You know, his work rate, combined with his punching power, is overwhelming. His opponents know what's coming. You know, hard right jabs, left crosses, that two-fisted attack to the body. They know what's coming, but they can't do anything about it. My take is that this will look like a tactical battle for a little while, as they, they both uh, jockey for position. And it is tempting to debate and analyze, you know, how their styles match up and how Crawford's switching style will negate Spence's softball advantage or how uh, Spence's work rate will be too much for Crawford. But ultimately, I think that um, all that talk is irrelevant. I think that this fight will come down to just that one sequence, that one exchange where Crawford has improvised, finally found the opening, and he hurts Spence. Now, he may be behind on points, but when Crawford, hit, when Crawford hurts Spence, he'll finish him. And it's really close. I could be wrong, and if you're going to bet, bet, bet small. <laughs> so that's it for this edition of the Monday Morning Corner Man. I, uh, next week, we have two high-profile fights, uh, Shakur Stevenson versus Oscar Valdez, and the female fight, you know, arguably one of the most uh, significant in the history of women's boxing, as Katie Taylor takes on Amanda Serrano. Uh, I think that's going to be a good one. Again, if you have any questions you'd like to hear in the mailbag, feel free to send them in the comments section below. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.